We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is a new guest to the show, Mart Wahlberg, founder of the Contrarian Codex and also known as Yellow Bull 11 on Twitter. How are you today, Mart? Doing great, Tom. Thank you very much for having me on. I re- always really enjoy your interviews. Thank you very much. And it's a, it's a pleasure to have you and to, uh, to touch on the uranium market with you today. So why don't we start by getting you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what has gotten you so interested and, and motivated in the uranium space? Well, last year, I really started looking into the uranium space. I, uh, I was an investor before that as well. I was always looking to find like new opportunities, but it was very hard to really find deep value with a good like risk to reward proposition. And then I ran into uranium. I didn't really think much of it at first, but the moment like I really started looking into it more and more, I found out that nothing, both nothing was really as interesting as the uranium sector, as well as the more I looked into it, the more I saw like an enormous value proposition with apparently very little risk to the downside. So from there, I wrote an 18-page thesis on it. I started sharing that on Reddit. I started after that, I started sharing that on Twitter, and I just became very passionate about everything there was to know about uranium and the investing side that comes with it. And here we are, like approximately one and a half years later. It's been an amazing journey so far, but I genuinely think that we have a lot more ground to cover in the uranium sector. It should be a very exciting one to two years. Absolutely. So when we when we think about, let's say, the, the main arguments against nuclear power plants, safety is always an issue. So how safe are the newest generation of reactors? And, and maybe share with us some considerations around that. Extremely safe. Even the older generation reactors are very, very safe. When you look at like the deaths per terawatt hour of energy produced, you have approximately 0.07 deaths per terawatt produced nuclear power. Oil and brown coal are way higher than I think brown coal is at approximately 32.68, which is a lot more than that. So nuclear is very, very safe. Even when you count uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, the disasters that are often quoted as a case against nuclear power. Uh, Another case against nuclear power is the waste. But when you think about it, in your entire life, you're a very energy consuming person. You use your entire life. generating your electricity from nuclear power, you approximately get one coal can of waste attributed to that energy use of your entire life, which is definitely not a lot. With oil, with coal, with gas, it's put into the air. With solar and wind, it's hard to really recycle those. And it's captured. And in the future, we hope to have a way to really uh, be able to recycle that in newer breeder reactors or to have a way to, to just get rid of it in a more efficient way. But to have a like a waste source that you can store, it's yeah, it's it's a great way to um, to de- to debunk that bear case, in my opinion. But as we uh, as we're seeing right now, we're seeing a lot more folks as well on like the newest generation of nuclear power, which is uh, which comes in the form of small modular reactors, which are basically, as the name states, smaller versions of nuclear power plants, which are a lot more flexible, uh, hopefully easier to build, more cost effective, and there is a lot of millions or even billions of dollars in the world being put to the research of that, exactly that technology. So that we can hopefully use that maybe at the end of this decade, maybe next decade, as another version of a green base load, reliable energy source that nuclear power is. So I really hope that we can get to that point that it can be implemented um, basically all over the world. But uh, yeah, we're definitely making big steps in the sector right now. And it's great to see so much support being, uh, being thrown at nuclear power because it's definitely been different in the past decade. Mm-hmm. This idea of the the public perception of nuclear energy, in my opinion, really has to change. And I appreciate you know you giving us your time to help kind of change this this attitude towards nuclear. And as you as you said before, you know there's the 
the secondary consideration of the the waste fuel that comes out of these traditional plants, there are technologies being developed to be able to use um, that fuel to actually supply energy, right? Yeah, exactly. Like that's that's the one thing that we can really look forward to because we've not seen a lot of development into the nuclear sector because partly because of the public sentiment, but that's really changing right now. What you're seeing is that both from a geopolitical standpoint as, as well as what I just mentioned, the public sentiment standpoint, we see more support for nuclear power. We see life exchange for nuclear power plants, new builds to just give you a bit of context. Like there are approximately 52 reactors right now under construction, but there are a hundred more plants and there are over 300 in the world being proposed. So nuclear is anything but dying right now. And it's great to see that, especially in the energy crisis that we currently find ourselves in, that people are looking towards this, what I mentioned, this green base low power source to get a reliable, to get reliable energy to their houses. And yeah, that's great. So we still have big, big steps to make, especially with the research and development into what you alluded to, the, what we do with the waste and how we're going to use that in modern reactors. But uh, one step at a time, and we're taking big steps right now. Mm-hmm. So just to kind of contrast that, Mart, if you could maybe lay out for us how efficient uh, a nuclear power plant is versus um, you know how much wind and solar actually produces and how much land we would need to basically use up to be able to supply ourselves with enough um, wind and solar to power our modern lifestyles? Well, there's two ways to look at that. You can start with uh, the simple metric, which is uh, land area of use, which is where you look at look, right, how big is a nuclear power plant and how much uh, energy is produced, let's say one gigawatt. If you would put that in like solar panels or windmills, you would need a far, far larger area. So it's very efficient for land use, which again, gets that ESG like it, requirement which is good for the climate um, for a bit of context in the netherlands where i'm based there was a study done by the university of wageningen where they basically stated that you could and the netherlands is a very windy country so we're perfect for building a lot of windmills to try to get as much energy use out of it as possible if you would build our entire country full of windmills in every possible location as well as our part of the north sea you would only meet around half of the requirement of the annual power requirements of the country. Nuclear power, so much more efficient because nuclear power, and that's the second point, has a much higher capacity factor of approximately 93.5%. Wind and solar at best are around or well below 30%. So you have that better, more efficient land use as well as a better capacity factor. And that is why nuclear power can offer the solution. It shouldn't be the only solution. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm all for having solar and wind as well. We need a combination to meet these carbon neutral goals in the coming decades. But nuclear power, shouldn't. it shouldn't be underestimated what a big, big role it can play. And people are realizing that. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there's, you know, public opinion, not only um, opinion, but also funding is changing towards nuclear as well. Biden recently signed an infrastructure bill. And as part of it, there is $62 billion for US energy. And that includes $6 billion to prevent premature retirement of existing reactors and another $2.5 billion to develop advanced reactors. So is this a, a major sign that, that things are changing in the US? Absolutely. And one thing that really speaks to that, not only this infrastructure bill and six billion shouldn't be underestimated, it's a great contribution to the domestic nuclear power sector in the US. But just as an example, we recently saw two of the biggest nuclear power plants in the entire country, in Byron and Dresden, being saved basically on the last or the last day or the last week. And that was great to see. And unlike the case for uranium investing, that's safe around 3 million pounds of uranium in demand a year. So that was great, but it's also great that that stayed and the country as a whole just can benefit from nuclear power just like a bit longer. We're now also seeing um, 
more support that could come from Europe. We're seeing the EU taxonomy now being discussed that it could potentially include nuclear power. There are a lot of cases to be made by countries like France to include that. So I hope that happens as well. There will be another tailwind and it will allow nuclear to compete more cost efficiently with these other power sources. And the real growth story and the real like uh, capital being thrown at the nuclear power sector happens in the East. One of the biggest examples has been China, who announced, well, who announced, who emphasized that they were planning to build 150 reactors by 2035, which would land at a program worth $440 billion approximately, which is which is a frankly ridiculous amount. It would add so much new demand, but it will also add so much of that green capacity. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of support. We're seeing a lot of capital, as you mentioned, uh, landing into the sector. And I think that will only continue. J- Japan is starting to restart some of their plants now as well, right? Correct. Correct. They're in the middle of election, um, election year right now, I believe. And their new proposed prime minister is really looking at nuclear power as uh, as part of the solution as well. So they still have some sequestered nuclear capacity that, re- that they can be looking to uh, bring back online. It remains to be seen if they're building new nuclear power plants, but keeping those online that they have right now, as well as restarting some, that is something that we definitely want to see if, for the sake of energy security, but also for the sake of the uranium bull thesis. It's not a be all end all catalyst because uh, we've seen so many other catalysts come in from so many other places, but Japan restarting nuclear power plants, it's not the overhang for the uranium sector that it was perhaps um, seven, eight, nine years ago. And that change in uh, change in direction is, uh, is great to see. Mm-hmm. Do we by chance know, Mark, how much new fuel supply those 150 plants in China will need to come online? Around 67.5 million, which for a bit of context is, would take up most of the large large uranium mine in the world is Kazakhstan. They're based in Kazakhstan. And they, if, if they ramp up to full production, that 150 new reactors would take up most of that supply. And that's the largest uranium miner in the world with a, by far the largest market share. So that is some context that is basically frightening if you look at um, future demand projections because demand side models have had to be revised and revised upwards pretty dramatically. And yeah, if you look at uh, if you look at the uranium supply and demand story, into the end of this decade, we were seeing existing mine supply roll off a cliff. We're seeing Kassan and Prom publicly say that after 2028, they will need a lot of new investment into new uranium properties to meet all the new demands. They have publicly stated that we need one or two more Kassan and Proms after 2030. And if we want to see that supply get to all those reactors that are proposed to being built and are currently being built as well, we're going to need more. We're going to need a higher price of uranium to incentivize new production, incentivize enough brownfield production coming back online. And that's the crux of this investment thesis. You, the, what you look for, the approximate equilibrium price level is around $65. I think that needs to be revised upwards, seeing all the supply bottlenecks, inflation, and commodity pricing. We're seeing DFS studies of various companies um, being revised to the upside to reflect all those price increases. So yeah, we will definitely need to reach 65 first, but I think uh, we can go a lot higher than that than we're 45-ish right now. So a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you know, there's this extremely mismatched supply demand characteristic in the market um, looking out ahead and, you know, looking over even the medium term, it's not like Kazatomprom is projecting to flood the market with new supply. So what are they projecting, let's say, for the next two to five years for increasing their production? Well, Kazatomprom has publicly come out and stated that they have um, they have really changed the way that they uh, they proceed or they go about um, 
they go about the way in the uranium market because previously they really like threw a lot of supply into the market, caused a lot of oversupply as well as other mines. But after they um, they floated part of their company publicly, they have changed their they have changed the way they've modernized their board, they've modernized the way they go about things, and they're really chosen to go for quality over quantity, which is very good for the uranium market. And they have stated time and again that they have uh, they are currently operating around 20% below subsoil user agreement for maximum output in in Kazakhstan. And they have stated that they won't be upping that at least until 2024. So the next year, 2022, and after 2023, they will be operating below that maximum capacity level. And it's great to see that they're sticking to that and they're really telling the market, like, we're not going to flood the market. And one of the biggest statements they made, in my opinion, recently was one of their presentations where they put in the line, there may not be enough guaranteed supply for everyone. And I think that's so true. And I think that will ring true more and more every single month in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. Let's move to, you know, talking about another supplier, let's say um, a little bit closer to home for, for most people. And that's chemical. So they had to shut in a couple of their mines, some of them due to COVID, some of them due to flooding. Um, what does their supply picture look like? Well, right now they have brought back Cigar Lake, which was offline due to COVID, which took, again, took a lot of supply off the market. It's, it's back now, but it's not back at full capacity. It will take around six months to a year to try to ramp back up to full capacity, and that will be relatively fast. They've also shut in another massive mine back in 2017, which is called McCarver River. And they shut that down because they didn't want to, they wanted to have homes as they described themselves for their supply. And if they couldn't get, if they couldn't secure those homes, there was no reason to keep the supply line. So for the sake of the market and for the sake of really like sequestering those tier one pounds, they wanted to keep them into the, in the ground. Here is the thing that some people overlook. If you want to bring back McCarthy River, even at higher price levels, it's going to take a long time to properly bring back to find the right personnel to operate a very complex mine, as well as ramp it up to full capacity. In my personal opinion, and I think a lot of people, including those chemical sheriffs as well, is that recovery will likely not come back online before 2024, 2025. And that's a large mine. And this is something, sorry to get off topic here, but nope. like we're talking about something close to home and now I'm going to move uh, to a few mines in Africa or in Australia as well, which is a bit farther from home. But those have brownfield projects as well. And what you see is that with a high cost and finding the right personnel, it takes a long time and it takes a long time to bring back online. So even at a higher uranium price, where you see perhaps with some other commodities where supply can be switched on much faster, with uranium, that supply response, even at a higher price, even at a price where some of these companies will become profitable, it will be a lot harder for that supply to come back online and hit the market to suppress the price. So that's something that only underpins this bull case. And in the case of Cameco, with Mokar River not coming back for a few years, it's like not yet at full production. Yeah, it's uh, the supply uh, picture is looking um, debatable. That's a that's a great way to put it, Mark. So you know we've we've seen the spot market just get decimated over the past, let's say, eight to ten years, and there are a couple differences, key key differences to understand um, in the different markets. Um, for for those that don't understand it. So why don't you walk us through the difference between the spot market, the long-term contracting market, and the conversion and enrichment prices? So what you have with uranium is that I just talked about supply not being able to quickly meet like um, demand that is coming online. Part of that is because of the reason I just described, but part of that is also because uranium doesn't go from the ground straight into a nuclear power plant. It goes through through a fuel cycle. It goes through conversion, it goes through enrichment. 
before it can be made into fuel pellets and before it can be put into a reactor. That's an oversimplification, but you get the point. And that we've seen prices of that fuel cycle with conversion and enrichment, we've seen those rise over the past few years. And one key thing to note is that in every single past bull market that we've seen in uranium, we've never seen a disconnected bull market. What I mean by that is if you see uranium, if you see conversion and enrichment go up, you free weight, you, the uranium that the miners pull out of the ground, has always followed the price action. We've seen great price action from it. We've seen a bull market in those two categories of the fuel cycle in the past few years. And now uranium is uh, is going to follow that path. So what is the new contract cycle that the utilities are going to be looking at to, to really come back online? And you know how does that affect... A the long term contract pricing and does it does it have any effect on the spot market pricing as well? Definitely, and that's where we get into the other part of the market, which is the tour market. So you have the spot market and the tour market, and the largest part of the activity in the uranium sector goes through the tour market. So we've seen a lot of activity on the spot market recently with spot, but we're going to get into that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we the most of the activity you will see on the tour market. So what we've seen is that. Um, supply comes mostly into the picture in long-term contracts. Like these utilities that need uranium, they're going to sign long-term 8, 10, 12 years to really uh, secure long-term supply for their reactors. And back in 2006, 2007, we've, we saw at the peak of the cycle, we saw a lot of contracts being signed, 110, 120 percent of annual demand being contracted. What changed is that after Fukushima in 2013, we've seen on an average annual basis, contracts being signed at approximately 32% of annual demand, which is far below the needed levels. So contracts are currently rolling off and with all the price action and interest from financial players that we've seen, what you see right now is not only an increase in the spot price, you're also seeing an increase in the, in the price pricing mechanisms in the tour market, you see that a lot more RFPs, which stands for requests for proposals, are hitting the market. You see utilities testing the waters. You see them looking to sign these new long-term contracts. So we've not seen a, the start of the real contracting cycle. Well, we've seen the start of it. We've not seen the full force of what a contracting cycle can do to the price of uranium. and. This brings me this brings me full circle back to the thing that Conservatory mentioned is that there may not be enough guaranteed supply for everyone, and I think that is why we will see a dramatic increase in the price of uranium, both in the tour market and definitely in the spot market, given the recent uh, influx of uh, financial player interest. So, are they saying that there isn't going to be enough actual supply to meet their existing contracts that they have already signed? Well, they're basically saying, at least in my mind, is that there won't be enough uranium to meet all the new demand that is projected to uh, to come online in the market. And with their supply potentially being eaten up by mostly from the east, that leaves a big supply gap in the west that needs to be filled with uh, with new mine supply. And that new mine supply needs a higher price of uranium. It needs time and needs a higher price. Mm-hmm. So. You know, when we consider what affects the uh, spot market, um, obviously there's a lot of people that have seen um, Sprott's new vehicle spot uh, really affect the the upwards price movement of the spot market. So, why did they have such a large effect on that market? So, for a bit of context, Sprott is one of the largest resource investment firms in the world. And they took over management of a uranium physical holding company called Uranium Participation Corp a few months ago. And what they did is they changed the structure and they implemented an ATM, which is an art at the market offering. And what they can do is when they're trading at a premium at a higher than a 1% premium, they can issue shares to raise capital to then purchase uranium right then and there, which gives them a lot of flexibility and a lot of pricing power in the sector where they can buy a lot of pounds very quickly if they're trading at premium, if they have that cash position. So we're seeing like a very experienced research firm of very experienced people 
coming into the uranium market, purchasing a lot of physical pounds. And they've purchased 21 million pounds since the launch of their ATM. Again, I love giving a bit of context to, and the same for this again, is that with that 21 million, they could fuel a large part of France's entire nuclear fleet for an entire year. And that's just in a few months. And I think that we have not even seen the full potential of this of this spot of spot of the Sprott fiscal uranium vehicle, because they are currently looking to list on the New York Stock Exchange as well. And what that will that will do a few things. But one of the biggest things that it will do, one of the biggest two things it will do, is it will give uh, the largest investment market in the world access to a safe and reliable way to play the Uranium bull market. And I think that a lot of financial players are going to be very, very interested in that. Not only because it tracks the price of physical Uranium, and that is a good way to, to play the Uranium bull market if you want to play it in a safe way, but it will also be a very liquid vehicle. It will be well managed. And the thing that it will do is that if a lot of money comes in uh, on the back of that New York Stock Exchange listing, we've seen a lot of money, don't get me wrong, we've seen a lot of capital flow into this uh, vehicle as of right now, but that New York Stock Exchange listing could be a game changer. And what that will do is a lot of capital will come in, the price of uranium will rise because a lot of new pounds will be bought. It will further validate the bull market because as we know, price movement justifies the narrative. And that will draw in further capital flows, which becomes something of self-fulfilling prophecy. And the outcome of that, people often ask me for price predictions. And let me just get this out of the way right now. I honestly have no idea where the price of uranium could go because there are a lot of factors involved. And picking price targets is, in my opinion, not the best thing to do because you need to take it like one step at a time, look at prevailing circumstances. But I think that we will definitely reach triple digit uranium and that will be enough to send equities soaring higher. And I think that this entire investment thesis, even without the New York Stock Exchange listing, is uh, just getting better by the day. And you know, part of the dynamic of sending the equities much higher is that it's it's such a small uh, investing space to be able to to find a home for your capital if you want to get into the uranium space, right? Absolutely. The uranium space, all the publicly traded companies right now have a combined market cap of around 47.3 million at the time of million billion at the time. It's not that small. 47.3 billion at the time of recording. Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, that's ridiculously small. When you look at Tesla being valued at a trillion dollars in market cap, when you look at something like Dogecoin, having a $30 billion market cap, which it actually had a bigger market cap a few months ago than the entire publicly traded uranium uh, sector, which is frankly ridiculous. So when a lot of capital wants to go in, when they see this fundamentally underpinned bull market taking place, and when they see all the new support for nuclear power and they see uranium really taking off, there will be so much capital that can potentially come into this sector. And we've already seen that, but I think that we've not even seen half of it. There is so much more capital that could potentially play a part in it. And that well, it remains to be seen how high we can go, but uh, I'm pretty optimistic. So I'd like to go back to um, talking about Sput a little bit. What happens when they, let's say, fill their coffers or, you know, what happens to that physical uranium? Um, do they end up selling it back into the market at the top? How does, do you know how that works? Well, that's uh, that question has been asked a lot of times to Sput themselves as well and the uh, CEO. And um, basically what they are, they are, they have created um, a closed end fund, which means that the, with the capital, they buy the physical uranium and they store it on special storage sites. And they have no intention to sell that or to use it in contracts or to do whatever for the foreseeable future. That supply is off the market. It's sequestered and sprout. Some people have been describing sprout as basically an end use because it goes in, but it doesn't come out, at least not for the foreseeable future, 
which takes away the, the potential that some people were describing as at the start of when they took over, like maybe this could be a supply overhang, but it's definitely not that. It's a, it's a closed end fund and that just adds to like the supply gap that we're already seeing forming. So are there any other vehicles that are looking at doing the same by helping draw down these physical inventories? You have uh, Yellow Cake PLC out of London who will have an agreement with Cassandra to take um, to take some supply off of them as well to store on their site or to store on their balance sheet. But um, there are other financial players that are currently also looking to store uranium in one way or another. And we've recently seen Cassandraprom agreeing to finance part of a deal to create a physical vehicle as well in the East. Uh, but that remains um, to be seen how that exactly works. Like there are not a lot of details have been released. Will that be more of a supply overhang or will it be a reason to just spark extra production or will it really be something like Sprott and will that be another uh, great vehicle that will draw capital from countries in Asia to that vehicle with the same purpose. So I don't want to say too much about that because there's still details yet to be released, but that's also a good development. So yeah, no, we've seen a lot of interest in physical uranium, not the least of which also with the miners themselves, we've seen a company like Denison buying 2.5 million pounds. We've seen chemical buying pounds. We've seen cassette problem in the spot market. So everybody seems to be interested in physical pounds of uranium. And uh, yeah, that will probably continue. So Bart, when we, when we think about, you know, trying to invest in this space, what are some, some good tips to think about when we're, when we're evaluating a uranium company to invest in? I think that besides like the thing, uh, the obvious statement that investing is always personal and that you always need to take into account like how much risk you want to take. I think that uh, there are three things you need to look out for when you're trying to invest into a uranium miner. This is this is not account for Sprott because they are a fiscal holding fund and they're a good way to play this market in a safe and reliable way, in my personal opinion. But if you look at the miners, explorers, the developers of uranium mines, these equities, you need to look at three things. You need to look at management. You want a management team that is experienced with the task. You don't want a management team that has explored for a silver vein in Mexico and is now trying to develop a uranium asset in the Athabasca Basin. It's great that they have mining experience, but it's not really relevant for the task at hand. So you want a management team that is really like experience equipped with the right experience and aligned with shareholders. You want a good asset in a, in a jurisdiction that has history with uranium mining. For example, you have the Athabasca Basin, but in Africa, you also have Namibia, which I think that Africa often gets a bad rap, but when it comes to Namibia, I think it's one of the best uranium jurisdictions out there. And you have a lot of uranium companies there as well. So you need to look at where is the asset located and also uh, how much has it, of the asset has been explored already? Has there been high-grade uranium found? How much has been found? Um, so that is one thing you need to take uh, you need to take into account. And the final thing is that you need to have a company that has a clear plan. If a company is sitting on a great asset but it's doing basically nothing with it, or if a company is ba- or if a company is trying to explore for uranium but you're seeing like a lot of GNA costs going into well. You're seeing a lot of capital going into that GNA cost, not a lot of capital going into the ground um, to drill, to try to expand on their uranium resource. That is something you need to take into. You need to have a plan to create real shareholder value. You need to have a plan going forward to take, to make the most out of the uranium bull market because you don't want to invest in a company that is just going to be exploring and drilling for more shareholder value. You want a real company that is has a real asset, a real good management team, and is trying to create real shareholder value. And I think as the cycle progresses, because in the last uranium bull market we had, we saw 500 companies in a space. Right now, it's something close to 70 or 80. That number is growing, and the more it grows, the more companies, more companies that don't particularly have the best intention for shareholders in mind will enter the space and will buy a piece of land and they will say like, oh, now we're a uranium company. Keep that in mind. Be critical in your stock picking 
and pick the uranium companies that show real value. So how would you go about building a uranium portfolio, let's say? Would it include, um, you know, maybe three different categories, a producer, a developer, and a um, explorer section? Uh, what I would personally do is something that if you don't want to go for uh, an ETF, which, for example, the URM ETF offers a great diversified basket of uranium equities but if you want to like build your own portfolio i would build it in a pyramid like fashion where you start with a strong base of the best of the best developers and producers something like chemical cassette and prom next gen global atomic denison and the best of the best um, producers and developers then you can build upwards the pyramid gets smaller so the allocation to set equities also may get smaller and he built on more speculative equities maybe a developer who has just started developing a new asset maybe an explorer who hasn't found anything yet but they're sitting on a, on a little piece of land that could potentially offer great of a great prospect of finding high grade or a lot of uranium so if you build it in that way you always have that strong base and then you can build on that with more speculation because what's one thing to notice that while a rising tide may uh, float all boats, if that's the right way to uh, to guess that phrase, um, it won't float all boats equally. There will be some laggards, there will be some that don't perform nearly, nearly as well. There will be some that, perform, that outperform. And while explorers could genuinely produce life-changing, outperforming returns. That's not guaranteed. And that brings with it risk as well. So I think that if you underpin your portfolio with good companies, with proven pounds, existing production capacity or an existing or existing high-grade uranium mines, that is what you want to see. And then you can go for adding more torque because nothing is guaranteed in this market. So as you say that there's there's nothing guaranteed in this market, at what point do you try and take some profits or, or try and exit some of these positions, Mark? That's the million dollar question. That is because it's easy to, uh, to get in. It's harder to sit. And the hardest part is exiting. It always is because in these cyclical commodity businesses, you see um, price underperform for a long period of time, which has came out of a decade long bear market. And then the price rises, it busts straight through equilibrium levels because that's basically what most cyclical businesses do. And then at some point the cycle is going to turn and it's going to come back right down again. And that's gonna be the drop is usually just as steep as the rise upwards. So what you would want to do, in my personal opinion, is you want to scale out in different tranches. You don't want to tie, you don't want to try to time the top because almost no one will do that successfully. So if you scale out in tranches at various intervals, you can really prevent genuine capital destruction when the cycle turns. And there are three things uh, in my view which you want to look out for. You want to look out for capital flows, you want to look out for uh, just share investor psychology because when you look back, when you study psych, um, so like cyclical businesses and cyclical cyclical commodity booms, you can go back all the way to like the 1600s, 1700s. If it's in the tulip bubble, you can go all the way like a hundred years back in various commodities cycles. And you see that investor psychology is often the same. You see mass euphoria, you see like everybody wants in, everybody's talking about it. And that's when you really want to watch out. And the, first, and the third thing that you want to look out for is the thing that we already touched upon is contracting. I told you that um, since 2013, the average annual or the average uh, contracting rate was 32% of annual demand. When you see that rise to over 100%, to 110, 120, 130% for a sustained period of time, you know that they're signing long-term contracts and that um, the risk to ward proposition is slowly but surely shifting more towards the risk side of things. And that's when you want to look for uh, scaling out slowly but surely. So that's what we're starting to see right now? That's exactly what we're starting to see right now. 
Excellent. So, Mart, are the, all of these subjects some some of the things that you cover in the uh, Contrarian Codex? Absolutely. What I cover on the Contrarian Codex is I write a once every two weeks I write a newsletter on uranium to cover everything that we're seeing to cover various equities. I also every two weeks uh, I do an interview with either a CEO of a company, perhaps a private investor to really get to the bottom of certain things, taking questions, really digging to the uranium market or into other contrarian investment opportunities. And also other things that I write. For example, I recently released a 32 stock sample portfolio. We just discussed the pyramid approach. In this sample portfolio, I go through four categories of eight companies each with low risk, medium risk, medium high risk, and high risk. And things like that, and individual analysis on companies as well. And uh, no, it's been great. We also have a great Discord server. Everybody's sharing a lot of experiences. And uh, it's great to have a group of like-minded investors uh, along for the ride. It's been great to work on this. Excellent, Mark. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up here? Definitely. If somebody wants to uh, sign up for the Codex, but they first want to see, for example, a newsletter, feel free to send me a message via Twitter on my handle yellow 11 or uh, send me an email at contrariancodex at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to send you one of my previous newsletters and uh, we can go over it. And I hope to welcome you as a new subscriber to the Contrarian Codex. Excellent, Mark. And of course, the Codex is available at patreon.com slash contrarian codex. Mark, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I hope uh, we can discuss a lot more uranium in the years ahead. I, I look forward to it. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.